two, you know, the two really low-hanging fruits that are out there that are easy to make mistakes on you know, compared to air, which is really complicated. Drive you guys crazy trying to talk about air. So I'll turn over to J.D. Fennigan. He's been with, with the company not as long as I have. Uh, you know, really getting into understanding stormwater permitting, you know, all the requirements that go into it, and he's happy to share this information with you. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for being patient, taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. <coughs> As Brad mentioned, we're going to be going over, doing an overview of stormwater prevention planning. Now, while you're taking a peek at the overview for today's presentation, I thought I'd give you, take a moment to give you an overview of my background. So, I have a degree in bioenvironmental science from Texas A&M, minored in agronomy. Uh, my first job in regulatory compliance was a little different from, from how Brad started out. I was one of those who started out more on the environmental side and slowly got pushed into safety. But at the same time, I also uh, still had a, I always had the, the environmental facet of the job in the back of my mind. So I always uh, tended to notice little bits uh, from the, the front end of my career kind of trickling into every, uh, even my current position. But, I started out as an environmental investigator for the Galveston County Health District. Uh, I had a short stint there uh, before I moved down to the Port of Brownsville where I was hired as an EHS compliance inspector. Uh, we were monitoring maritime uh, ship dismantling operations and uh, definitely learned quite a bit, uh, not just about stormwater, but fall protection, uh, hazard communication, waste disposal. It was uh, a good introduction to quite a bit uh, on the regulatory compliance side. Uh, <clears throat> after about five years working there, I uh, eventually made my way to Austin, got here as soon as I could. Uh, my first job here was, uh, was actually as a project uh, safety superintendent for a construction company. So I started off environmental, went EHS, and then I was strictly safety. However, uh, as some of you may know, when it comes to a construction project, once you break ground on more than an acre, that project has to have its own SWIFT plan. So uh, monitoring uh, silt fences, mulch socks, making sure we weren't tracking dirt out onto the, onto the road, that was all part of the process too. And uh, whether we were assigned those roles or uh, voluntold, as we might have referred to it on, on occasion, uh, that, was, that was part of the that was part of the, the plan. So I've been with uh, Bird Compliance for go, uh, just about four years now. I've been managing both construction and general industry clients. And stormwater is a topic that comes up uh, quite often. First and foremost, what is stormwater? Well, in short, it's the runoff caused from the rain. If it rains, it drains. And the goal of your stormwater plan to prevent any sort of contamination of stormwater from reaching any sort of waterways. So that's especially true with the Edwards Aquifer. If there's any possibility that a waterway from your facility can feed into the Edwards Aquifer, that just means your plan's gonna have probably an extra inch of paperwork to go with it. But when it comes to contamination, contamination from what? Contamination can be broken up to a number of different groups. First of all, we have sediment. This reduces the amount of light in the water that's available for plant growth. Uh, that can decrease food supplies to other organis organisms in that body of water. Uh, in the case of fish, uh, sediment has been known to clog gills and even uh, cause damage to sensitive tissue. And in, on a long enough timeline can lead to suffocation and by forming thick deposits where uh, suspended material settles out. Another type of pollution, nutrients. Uh, with an, an overabundance of nutrients in the water, this can cause uh, increased growth of aquatic weeds, this can cause uh, algal blooms, and uh, with excessive aquatic growth and algae, this can cause choke points in lakes and streams and uh, <coughs> can lead to a dramatic daily fluctuation in dissolved oxygen levels. Speaking of oxygen, oxygen banning substances. Sometimes you, uh, you have chemicals that can be introduced into the water that are attracted to oxygen. And this can decrease uh, ox 
oxygen levels. This can lead to um, uh, fish kills. And uh, in any case, uh, whenever you have a decreased level of oxygen, especially to the point where it's having a detrimental effect on aquatic life, uh, this of course can lead to an unpleasant uh, odor. Uh, who's ever been uh, down to South Padre for a vacation? Show of hands. All right, keep your hands up if you've ever been there during a red tide. Y'all ever, anyone ever experienced that one before? Whether it be down in Padre or otherwise? Yeah, that's, this is a good example of that. That's, a, that's an example of both uh, an algal bloom and oxygen demanding substance. Essentially, the, the algae that blooms during a red tide produces an aerosol that leaches on to the oxygen in the water. This can lead to fish kills. This also leads to uh, aerosols being released into the air that can cause irritation to the uh, respiratory tract. It's not a pleasant experience, never is. Um, <clears throat> but that's just an example of how things, of just a, a, a large scale example of how that sort of a pollutant can go from bad to worse in a fairly short time frame. And then you got microorganisms. Any sort of, uh, <clears throat> any sort of organism that's not necessarily uh, native to a, a, a given body of water can, can have a detrimental effect. So it's not just the zebra mussels that can, can shake things up. The microbes can do just as much. And when it comes to microorganisms, uh, it's actually surprising uh, how many microbes are uh, residing in just the top six inches of soil. So if you ever have uh, any sort of uh, breaking ground on site and any of that soil kind of runs off, this is an example of where a microorganism can be introduced into a body of water it wasn't normally uh, observed. So when it comes to regulatory requirements, of course it starts off with the Clean Water Act. Initially, that was the Federal Water Pollution Control Act amendments of 1972. The EPA has their general stormwater permit. TCEQ does as well. And then for manufacturers, that's generally going to be your multi-sector general permit. And of course, your SIC code, which drives the permit. It essentially tells you what parts of the permit you have to leave in, which parts you can take out. Essentially, it tells you how you're going to customize that plan. So <coughs> when it comes to your multi-sector permit, there are, it <coughs> it's designed to be a plan for any sort of company that has industrial activities somewhere in their process. And your SIC code is there to define exactly what category or classification of industrial activity you have. So the SIC, standing for Standard Industrial Classification, it's more than just a four-digit code. It's letting regulators know exactly what type of business you do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And in, some, in many cases, you might have a facility that has multiple operations going on that are all generating revenue. And in that case, you might have to choose a primary SIC code. And this is generally the, the code that is dealing with the highest net revenue at your facility. So to give you a little example, let's say you start a small machine shop. Buy a plot of land, get your facility built, business is good, and then all of a sudden you decide, we're gonna buy the, the two lots next door and turn that into a little bit of a scrap yard. And business continues to go well, and you've got that, that pride in that, in, from the ownership of that machine shop. First and foremost, we're a machine shop. Well, if two thirds of your land is a scrap yard and that ends up being about 60% of your revenue, technically you're more of a metals recycler than you are a machine shop. So it's always, when it comes to selecting the SIC code for your plan, it's important to, to know exactly what, uh, <coughs> what's generating the highest amount of revenue for your company because that's the code you have to go with. But in short, your SIC code doesn't just let you know that you're gonna need a plan. It's letting you know what needs to be included in that plan. Now, when it comes to a, your plan, you might have a stormwater plan or you might have a chance for no exposure. No exposure, as, as uh, I believe Max uh, had mentioned earlier, just means that 
all of your, nothing's happening outside in general. More specifically, it means your industrial activities are taking place either indoors or under storm resistant shelter. And that's all of your activity. So start, just to give you some examples of what constitutes an industrial activity. First one, storage, loading and unloading, or transport of raw materials, intermediate products, byproducts, or final products. Which part of that doesn't sound like manufacturing? Pretty much if you're in the, if, if any of your scope of work is considered manufacturing, chances are you've got a, a stormwater plan that you need to develop. But if you can prove that all the materials and activities in your scope of work fall into that no exposure checklist, you might be able to apply for what's called a conditional no exposure exclusion. Now, does that mean you don't have to have a stormwater plan? To an extent. But it's still, even if you're under no exposure, you still have to have somebody who's doing a regular inspection to make sure that you continue to fall under that exclusion. Because just because you're under, under no, a no exposure doesn't mean you uh, aren't susceptible to an, a TCEQ inspection. So when it comes to conducting these inspections, whether you're under a no exposure or you're under a SWIP, you gotta have a team. Who is going to be helping you execute this plan? Are you gonna be assigning roles? Are, are you going to go through your employee list and see who has some environmental experience? Or are you just gonna try and dish it out, sort of assign these roles to somebody and then provide training later? Whatever the case may be, you gotta have some, you gotta have, gotta have a team put together, however many people it takes, to ensure that each part of this plan is being executed and implemented. So what goes into this plan? One of the most important parts of it are your maps. Don't let that word confuse you because uh, trust me, there's a lot more into these maps than just your outfalls. It is an important part, but looking at this, at this map in particular, some of the other uh, details that you need to have included the boundaries of your facility. Where does your land stop and what's, what's included on the inside? Your existing structures, as you, I'm sure you can see these arrows right here, directional flow, letting you know if you have any runoff, where is it going? This also helps when determining <coughs> your, your outfalls. So <coughs> you might, you know, some, when it comes to your uh, outfall selection and your sampling points too, this is why it's important to make sure that you're selecting these, if possible, during an observable rain event. You wanna see where this, where this water goes. But more importantly, you wanna see where it starts to run off the property. Of course, if you're dealing with a flood, it's just gonna go everywhere. But where does it start to leave your property? <laughs> That's where those outfalls are selected. Some other things to consider, any exposed materials. And if you have any exposed materials, what are, your, what are gonna be your best management practices for minimizing any sort of stormwater-based pollutant? Uh, starting off, pretty much we're all gonna have uh, tr uh, plant trash dumpsters somewhere on the facility, whether they have cover or not, is a case-by-case -case basis. Best management practice usually is to keep those, contain those containers covered and to exercise regular and frequent housekeeping uh, walkthroughs in order to minimize spills and just in general keep your, your facility both safe and clean. Whatever kind of cover you're going with, just make sure that it is approved for that use. Now, so I use this picture just to show you don't have to go out and buy a cover that's made out of the same material that they use to make the dumpster. Just needs to be approved for this sort of use. Spills are another part, as I believe Max uh, mentioned. Uh, any <coughs> spill above 25 gallons must be reported, and uh, it's no different with a, with a SWIP plan. Anything that would be considered uh, reportable is likely going to be anything above 25 gallons, or anything that creates 
machine on the water, especially if it's considered a navigable water. Just to give, uh, give you an idea of what this uh, reportable spill and, and leak form looks like, decided to blow it up and give you guys a chance to just get, a, get an idea of all the different types of information you're gonna need to provide in, in this sort of scenario. Next, you've got sediment and erosion control, not to mention runoff control. So you've got your map, you've got your outfalls, you know if you've got a rain event, the most likely point that that runoff is gonna exit your property so what are you going to do to minimize it? You've got a number of different uh, options out there. You've got dirt channels, vegetation and grassy areas can sometimes suffice. Uh, gravel surfaces, uh, I've, seen, uh, <coughs> I've seen more than one facility where they basically had a little bit of a French drain set up uh, right around an outfall. Straw waddles and sometimes commonly known as mulch socks are another common uh, form. Uh, I've seen straw walls used in just about every industry where stormwater was a thing. So I've seen that in the maritime industry, I've seen it in general industry, and I've seen it on construction projects. So these are pretty tried and true <coughs> methods. Uh, but as I mentioned, there are a number of different examples or types of uh, erosion control, sediment control, runoff control that are available. So there's more than one way to skin this cat. So, you've got your plan, your maps, every other aspect of <coughs> uh, that needs to be included, all the different details. So what's next? Management. You've got your team picked out, and everyone's got their assigned roles. So what, let's take a guess, what's probably one of the most important things that they have to do? I mean, of course, inspections are important, taking regular samples, of your, of your, of your uh, runoff is definitely important. Corrected, corrective actions for any observed deficiencies, whether it be internally. Understanding your weather events coming. That's another, that, that is a big, big part of it. You know, when it comes, especially if you're on any sort of a stormwater uh, pollution prevention team, checking your, checking the weather on a, on a daily basis is definitely recommended. But, <coughs> One of the most important aspects of your job as a member of that pollution prevention team is record keeping. One of the things I, uh, one of the reasons I, I talked about my, over, my background before is I've had a chance to look into and, and experience the environmental regulations, but also with a little bit of a, a viewpoint from a safety professional. And one thing I've learned from, uh, <coughs> from OSHA compliance is that if you don't have documentation, OSHA has to approve, basically assume that whatever you're claiming didn't take place. And it's no different with TCEQ. If you're, even if you're in doing everything you're supposed to on that plan, if you don't have the documentation to back it up, then they have to assume it didn't happen. And that's, a, that's usually one of the most, one of the more common citations that comes about when it comes to deficiencies with a, with a stormwater plan. So making sure that you don't just have a team, but that team is documenting everything that they're doing. Paramount. This starts off with quarterly inspections. This is definitely one where checking the weather at the beginning of the day is very important. Because you're not just walking around seeing if there's trash on the ground or any sheen on puddles or any sort of standing water. You're also documenting what sort of weather conditions you had that day. When did you start your inspection? What did, the, what did the sky look like? Was it sunny, overcast, was it starting to rain, partly cloudy? Did you have a front coming in? Sometimes I like to put the highs and lows for the temperature that day, plus the temperature at the start of the inspection. But in addition, especially once you get a few of these inspections uh, underway, some of the other things you want to keep in mind are failed control measures, any incidents of non-compliance since your last inspection or any previous inspections. You know, are you keeping up with your corrective actions, your best management practices? And then the identification of any existing BMPs that are not being properly or completely implemented. 
Who on the, who on the team is slacking off? <laughs> Nine times out of 10, that's what that's leading to. To give you an idea of what that quarterly inspection form should look like, as, as I mentioned, the date, time of the inspection, who is doing it, any applicable weather information, and what you saw, and how soon you think it could be fixed. In addition to your inspections, you got your visual monitor. At least once a quarter, you need to collect a sample for each of your outfalls. You want to try and conduct this during a measurable storm event. That means you have at least a 0.1 feet inch. inch. Okay, that was supposed to be a double. So once you have a tenth of an inch in rain, that's considered to be a measurable rain event. Now, <clears throat> within 30 minutes of the start of that event, that's the ideal time to go out and get that sample. At least that's when TCEQ wants you to. Now, if it's not practical, pra uh, uh, practicable to go out during the first half hour, you do have a little bit of a grace period to try and get it during the first full hour. But if you have to go beyond the first 30 minutes and you're in that 30 to 60 minute range, you still have to document what took place that caused you to delay that sampling. Whenever you do a quarterly visual monitoring, it has to follow the preceding measurable storm event by at least 72 hours. So for those of you who think that, oh, I'm gonna do one at the last day of the quarter, I'm gonna do another one at the first day of the next quarter, just to you know, try and get ahead. No, it doesn't work that way. <coughs> but in any case, you wanna make sure that you're documenting all your results. What do I mean by results? a whole list of things that you're looking for just by doing that visual check on that sample. Is there any issues with the color? Is there any odor coming from it? What's the turbidity or the transparency? Do you, is there enough sediment in that sample to where you can't, if you were to hold that sample up, you wouldn't be able to see your hand on the other side? Are there, is there any floating debris, settled solids, suspended solids, any other sort of what have you, such as foam, scum, oil shame, or any other sort of obvious indicators of, of stormwater pollution. It's very important to make sure that you're getting these visual checks on a regular basis because sometimes what you see during that, that sampling event could be what triggers a specific type of corrective action. Rainfall monitor. So one of the most, one of the, <coughs> most important parts of your stormwater plan is that you have a rain gauge set up somewhere on your facility. And at least once a week, someone's going out there to do at least a visual check on that rain gauge to see what's, what's happening on a regular basis. Now, TCEQ does understand that sometimes that process can be impeded by severe weather. And you definitely don't want to put anyone in harm's way if another Hurricane Harvey or, or a tornado or a flood were to happen. Do we still need to go out and do that weekly check? No. All we got to do is just make sure that if one of those events were to take place, it's being logged. So whether that's a severe storm, a flood, um, whatever the case may be. Water quality monitoring is another big facet of the plan. First and foremost, you gotta have a benchmark check at the beginning, just to see where you stand when that plan first get, goes into play. And then, usually at least annually, you have to do a follow-up sample to make sure that the plan is effective. And if you have any sort of exceedance from that benchmark, must be investigated within 90 days and all results from that must be documented. So we talked about quarterly inspections, but at least once a year, you have to do an annual inspection. And this can substitute one of your quarterly inspections. Uh, most often, this is gonna be Q4, because <coughs> it's not uncommon for someone to look at the plan and see, see that it's December 30th, and someone looks around and goes, did anyone do the annual? 
I've done an annual inspection on December 31st before for a different one. It's not uncommon. Um, occasionally you might have a facility that would choose Q3 just because it would correspond with their fiscal year, but more often than not, it's gonna be your fourth quarter. In short, your annual inspection is going to be a quarterly inspection plus a full review of your documentation. So this is where you do everything you would do in a quarterly inspection. Then you go back to the SWIP, to the SWIP binder and start saying, okay, are corrective actions being documented? Who did them? It, whenever an inspection is taking place, the company ex executives signing off, showing that the inspection forms were reviewed, corrective actions took place and were verified. You know, there's a lot of paperwork that goes involved with this and at least once a year, you just have to do a comprehensive check to make sure that everything is on the up and up. <coughs> All right, moving on, corrective actions. Correct. When it comes to stormwater pollution, you need to correct efficiencies as quickly as practical to avoid contamination or pollution. So, in a timely manner. Any sort of modifications or changes to the SWIP plan must be made within 30 days. So, if, uh, as we were talking about on the maps, any existing structures you have, if you were to build a new office or a carport for uh, employees to park, you know, once that structure is complete, you've got 30 days to add that to your map. When it comes to any sort of corrective action, if it's intended to take place longer than 90 days, I apologize for that typo, but TCQ needs to be notified if, it's, if the corrective action is gonna take longer than expected. But regardless, your corrective actions have to be documented. You need to have a description of what was done Preferably, you need to have an initial and date showing who verified that those corrective actions were complete and when. And one thing I always like to recommend, at least take an after picture. Have some sort of visual proof. If you can take a before and after picture, even better. But show what it looked like before and what it looked like once you were done. If anything, that's gonna be just another, uh, another leg to stand on in, uh, in an argument, so to speak. But Common citations, failure to maintain a drainage area site map, and or identify all required information. So if, uh, <clears throat> if you do have a new structure, or you move some containers around, or if there's just any sort of uh, change up around the facility, you need to make sure that you're making those corresponding changes to your map whenever they're applicable. Failure to conduct employee training and or education if you select and assign the roles for your pollution prevention team, did they receive stormwater training before they started executing any of those duties? Failure to implement best management practices and good housekeeping measures. You know, those best management practices on a plan look really nice, especially when they're very well worded. But if they're not being implemented, if they're not being carried out, that is never gonna look good. Good housekeeping measures, that's another, that's another one. We pretty much push that practice, whether we're talking about safety or environmental. You know, when it comes to safety, a clean site is a safe site. A clean facility is a safe facility. Same thing goes with when it comes to environmental. If you've got a clean site, what you have to clean up later, should there be an incident, will be minimized at the very least. But, when it comes down to it, the most common citation when it comes to stormwater pollution prevention plans comes from failure to perform required monitoring and sampling. And sometimes this can be from failure to actually carrying out those duties, but sometimes it's just failure to document. Your quarterly inspections, your periodic uh, routines of just monitoring the site, taking samples, doing your benchmark monitoring, failure to do an annual. If you didn't get that annual inspection in before December 31st, that is a huge one. But all of this comes down to making sure that you have documentation and whatever's being documented is being done. 
Are you doing what you're claiming? More often than not, and I find this with most regulatory agencies, if even if an inspection is triggered, if they, can, if they can prove that you actually tried to address a problem, especially if you tried multiple ways, 99 times out of 100, they're gonna work with you. That's, that's the time where you really try and set the tone for the inspection, just yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. Uh, you're gonna need to fix that. Okay, we can fix that right now. Having that positive attitude, having that go-getter mentality, that is going to help you so much in the long run. That's the way you want to start your inspection. That's the way you want to carry yourself throughout. But that way, if there's any sort of, uh, any sort of misunderstanding, so to speak, you have something to fall back on. We're doing this on a regular basis. We saw this during one of our uh, inspections. We did this to address it. We've got this as a backup plan. All of that comes back to you have a positive attitude about your, your SWIFT. Having a positive attitude, especially on having a proactive mindset about trying to prevent any sort of incidents and having a plan for correcting them should they occur, it's going to set the tone. Having said all of that, any of you have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much. And back to Brad. One of the big thing things about SWIFT is typically those that are the inspectors are probably going to be the, the city or the county that come out. Every now and then, CQ will pop up. But usually it's the local. 